We've got a recently approved agent. I'm going to try to pronounce this. And everybody knows for me this is a high wire act. Uh, Emesisumab. How did I do? Very good. Oh, great. I'm yes. not going to do that again. Um, talk about the indication, the dosage. I got it once and I'm through. The indication, the dosage, the mechanism of action. Go through this one. So this is an interesting, uh, this, this is basically a, a, a relatively new drug. It was been approved last November for inhibitor patients and just uh, literally a week ago was approved for all other patients, so whether they have an inhibitor or not. And uh, uh, this is an antibody, it's a monoclonal antibody, where um, basically what factor eight does, uh, this is to replace factor eight. Okay. And how does factor eight works? work? It allows factor nine and 10 to uh, touch each other. Nine, which is active, triggers the activation of 10, and then here we go down this cascade. Uh, this is an antibody that one arm binds to factor nine or 9A, and the other allows binding to factor 10, allows these two to kiss, if you will, and triggers coagulation. And it's an elegant uh, system that has uh, a number of properties that make it, uh, that will change, that it's gonna change this field. One is can be given subcutaneously in a relatively small volume less than a, C, uh, a mil, um, it can last up to uh, a month. The drug itself will last for several months. The half-life is a month, but the act clinical action will is good really for a month. So, so, so basically, uh, I'll let you sum, but it's an easier to give drug that lasts a long time, and whereas the other factors that we use have to be given multiple times intravenously over a week. So this emesisumab yes. is similar to eight in terms of its activity, yes. its actions, yes. but it has advantages. Yes. Small volume, yes. longer acting. Easier to give. Easier to give. And it seems to me, I, if I hear you correctly, there may not be antibodies to it. There are, but it's uh, at a rate that we talked about, 30 to 50%. Right. Uh, for the way these monoclonals were created, Historically, um, there are, as you know, a number of monoclonals now in medicine. The rate is anywhere from 1% to 5%, and the odds are even that's too high. It would probably be around less than 1%. So instead of saying no, they're low. They're low. It, they've already documented in clinical studies uh, patients who have developed one patient who has developed an antibody and I believe six, over 600 patients that have received it. How does the emesisumab molecule differ, let's say, from factor eight? Sure. So the way that they approached it was is that we know that if you give any other thing that looks like factor eight, your body's gonna neutralize it, right? It doesn't care what it is. The antibody is pretty specific, but it's a little bit promiscuous and it can bind to other things. And so somebody thought, well, if I make a monoclonal antibody, that replaces the function of factor eight, but it has no structural homology. So it doesn't look anything like factor eight, so your body does not recognize it as factor eight, but it replaces the function. And so this uh, Japanese scientist worked on this for almost a decade, which is unheard of this day, you know, in the grant cycles now, you have to develop something pretty quickly. He toiled away on this and came up with this drug, screened 40,000 antibodies and found the right combination that worked. And so it's a bispecific antibody. So it brings factor 9A and factor 10 together and you know, uh, activates the co coagulation cascade. And it does basically what factor 8 does. Um, so it replaces a lot of the function. It's not exactly the same. And the great thing about it, it was brilliantly designed. So they made it where if, if factor 8 was there, it would, uh, it would, un, um, it would be dis, um, sort of dislodged and factor 8 could bind. So the binding affinity is much lower than factor 8. So it won't interfere with your normal factor eight or infused factor eight. How is it not immunogenic? How yeah. is it that sure. you don't generate antibodies sure. to this? So, you know, if you watch TV, I mean, you watch any kind of sports, you see a thousand rheumatoid arthritis or plaque psoriasis commercials, right? I stay and, they're all, and they're all biologic agents. And we know that you will do, there is a risk of developing anti-drug antibodies. They tried to reduce the immunogenicity that's a humanized antibody. And because of that, they've only had one definite case of a neutralizing antibody against this that r made you not able to get it. So and the so, answer is they were very smart. They were very careful. They understood the science of this. And so there has been one patient on trial 
that's developed a neutralizing antibody and basically can't get the drug and developed that in week five. And so we haven't seen it in other cases in which they had to stop the drug. And so we do expect to see some cases, but obviously, you know, okay. after almost a thousand patients, it's pretty rare. So let's, let's run through some of the, the basic checklist items on sure. any new drug. Sure. Uh, are there patient factors where you would avoid using this drug? Yeah, I mean, so I guess I could start with the other side. So if a patient has an inhibitor, this is a fantastic therapy. The trials clinic showed superiority, which is unusual in a lot of clinical trials. They actually took patients that were on factor eight, um, and they took patients that were on their previous regimen, and they looked at the bleeding rate reduction. And in most of the cases, it was in the 80 to 90% reduction. Really? And so uh, patients typically had zero to two bleeds per year on the study. And this is a population that bleeds a lot. And so just, you know, just recently, they received the indication for non-inhibitor patients. And so for the inhibitor patients, I think it's pretty straightforward. Very efficacious, quality Everybody of life. It's a no-brainer. Right. On the on non-inhibitor side, obviously, we have to think a little bit more because we, we do have a, a cohort of patients that are doing really well. You know, we see these patients. They haven't had a joint bleed in three to four years. They're doing their infusions. They're locked in, they're very comfortable in their therapy. And so it's just like anything else, there'll be early adapters that will say, yeah, I, you know, I want something different. Uh, I wanna try this because the route is different. So instead of IV, it's subcutaneous. And how and so, often, what's the half-life, how often do you give it? So the half-life of a factor eight product's about eight to 15 hours at yeah. the most. This is a 28 day half-life. Just, just stop. So, yeah, yeah. You know, this is a huge difference, an order of magnitude, several. Yes. So, so the, they have the label indication for once a week, once every two weeks, or once every four weeks. And so, you know, so we'll obviously choose kids, and, and, and there may be some reasons if they're playing in competitive sports that we want to have maybe a little bit less peaks and troughs. Mm -hmm. So we might go one, once a week or once every two weeks. But you think about the guys that are at home, maybe they're not as active. They don't want to do IV therapy. They could do once a month emicizumab, and it, it just, um, I mean, there's really no reason they couldn't do something like that. I go like for that. once a month. I mean, yeah. Now, <laughs> does every patient who, who forms inhibitors get, or should they, in your view, yeah. get this emicizumab or not? Yeah, so I think it should be strongly considered, uh, be, um, and, and there's a huge debate. So we went to a meeting before, and they actually had a really interesting debate style. So they had one doctor say, we should still do immune tolerance. We should still try to get rid of the inhibitors. And another doctor would argue, why would we do that? We have this drug. Just put them on the drug. Yeah. Stop all this nonsense. And it was a vigorous debate. People standing up, you know, saying, you know, that's ridiculous. And so there's an ongoing debate now. And we actually have some early pilot studies in which you could potentially do both. It's not FDA approved for this indication, but we're going to present this data in two months. And we think there's actually... As everything else, there is a common ground, and maybe you can do both. Well, let's bring up one of the contraindications. Sure. Money. Yes. How much does this drug cost? So when you look at inhibitor patients, it's actually significant cheap, significantly cheaper. So if you take a teenage what, boy. What's cheaper? Yeah, so in hemophilia world, it's like monopoly money sometimes. So a typical, like let's take a 15-year-old boy, we're trying to treat his inhibitor, and the standard of care, which is high-dose factor and then prophylaxis with fiber or, or, um, or Novo7, that cost could range from one to $5 million per year, that one patient. This drug, on average for an inhibitor patient for that same child, will somewhere be somewhere between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars and $400,000. Still expensive, so not, but... So it's still expensive, but obviously just dramatically cheaper. And so, you know, there have been cases where, you know, some of these patients are obviously causing some disruptions of the market because, you know, that's not sustainable to spend $5 million per patient. To treat them. Obviously, we're trying to do what we can and we work really hard. But so the, obviously, the debate's going to come down now in the non inhibitor patients. So that same child's factor replacement, somewhere between 200 to 400,000. So it's awfully close. And so people that utilize high amounts of factor to not bleed, there's, it's, a, it's a no brainer, right? Some patients, it might actually be cheaper to use factor concentrates as well. So th that's the ongoing debate, and the insurance companies are going to look at this. You know, it's